It was a Sunday night, and we were sick of college cafeteria food. So we decided we were going to go and get a little taste of heaven. And heaven tasted at that time as a freshman in college like Olive Garden breadsticks. And so we were, we were headed to the Olive Garden because we were in college, so we were poor. But the beauty of the Olive Garden, we were also in college, so we were hungry all the time. And it's free, reloadable breadsticks. They will just keep bringing those bad boys to your table all throughout the meal. And so we were on our way to get those delicious bread. I mean, just the smell when you walk in. And none of us had girlfriends at the time, so it didn't matter. We could reek of garlic, salt afterwards. It was fine. So we, four of us, loaded into a Chrysler LeBaron convertible. I was in the back seat behind the driver because if you ever have to ride in the back of a car while it's not ideal, always be behind the driver because instinctively they care more about their side of the car than the passenger side of the car. <laughs> And so if I don't get shotgun, I'm at least riding behind the driver. And I was behind the driver. And I went to school at this, this small school in the middle of nowhere in Ohio. Literally, you would drive through 15 minutes of cornfields, and then there was just a college campus in a small little town. And so to get anywhere, you had to drive 20 to 30 minutes. And so we'd been driving through cornfields for about 10 minutes. And it was January, so... The convertible was up, and the windows were up, and we had, the, we had music playing. And out of the corner of my eye, on the left-hand side of the car, I saw in the distance a deer that was running in our direction. Because, as we've all established, deer are some of the dumbest animals that God has ever created. And rather than run away from danger, they like to run towards danger, and then just stop once they see a vehicle approaching. And I saw this deer running out of the corner of my eye, and we were headed about 60 to 70 miles an hour down the road, and the deer ran out, and I could see the entire thing playing out in my mind as it was happening. There, nobody else in the car could see the deer coming, and you don't want to shout deer because then they'll slam on the brakes, and, and it's just, so I'm just like, I'm frozen in time just watching this, and I watch as the deer runs right out in front of us, no time at all to hit the brakes or anything, and that Chrysler LeBaron destroyed Bambi. It shot Bambi up in the air onto the other side of the road. And for those of you who are like, oh, poor Bambi, you've never hit a deer with your car. Because if you have, you would despise deer. And you'd be like, you should have taken out two of them. And there, <laughs> there the deer lay. <laughs> yeah. PETA, it's Brian with an I at lakeside-church.com. And there the deer laid in the ditch. And then I'm like, flashing back to whether it was Tommy Boy or Dumb and Dumber, and I couldn't recall which. <laughs> but all, all I'm seeing is the animal that they thought was dead spring to life and destroying their vehicle even more, and them in the process. And so I'm standing back away from this deer, like I'm not getting anywhere near that thing. And we had to call a, a state trooper out to the scene, and he came, and he looked at the car and said, that doesn't look good. <laughs> we said, yeah, thanks. And Ben's a, Ben's a mess. I mean, of course this happens right after he spent a couple thousand dollars on repairs to the car, because when you're broke and in college and barely getting by, that's just what happens. You scrape together all you have, you repair the car, and then a couple weeks later, you just hit a deer in the car. Looks destroyed. He's like, but fire it up and see what happens. And he, he fired it up, and he was able to drive it back to school. But what had taken us 10 minutes going towards Olive Garden took us 45 minutes to get back to school. There were no breadsticks that night. There was no Olive Garden. We sat in the college cafeteria and ate bowls of cereal. As Ben called the insurance company the next day, and they sent an adjuster out a couple days later and said, your car's totaled. Now, ultimately, the car wasn't totaled. They were able to fight the insurance company and repair it for a couple more years, but I saw disaster coming, and I froze. 
And I didn't have really time to do anything, but I saw the disaster. I saw the threat that was on the horizon, and it materialized. And the consequences were severe. The destruction was big. And the cost was high. But there were warning signs. But it was too late for me to do anything about it. Some of you in your relationships right now are in that scenario where there is danger on the horizon. And for some of you, the danger's been on the horizon for so long that honestly, right now, if you were to act, it may be too late. Others of you, it's a long way off, but there's warning signs and there's things off in the horizon that if you don't address and if you don't correct the course of action that you're taking, if you continue down the path, you're headed down right now, the disaster that's off in the horizon is going to run in front of you and confront you head on and when that happens it will always be costly it will always be damaging and it will always leave scars we live in a society where half of the marriages end in divorce some of you have been there some of you have had to experience this heartache and this heart Some of you may be there right now. Some of you are headed there. How did we get here? What's what's going on and what can we do about it? We've seen that God's design for marriage and for relationships is, is is to be permanent. It's to be permanent. It's to come together as two individuals and become one. And that's to be a commitment that that lasts. That's God's design. We all want a great love story. We all want a great love story. But what happens when our dreams turn out to be a nightmare? And if you're there, I want you to know that there is hope. And if you're there, I don't want you to feel like you have to walk through this alone. But if you're not there, please, whatever it takes, don't allow yourself to get to that point. So we understand there's people all over the spectrum. And we're going to be talking about that today. So we're going to be looking at some different portions of Scripture. You can follow along in the events tab of your Bible apps on your phones or tablets. And if you don't have those available, you can follow along on the screen. We're going to start today in Malachi. Now, Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. He was the last writer of the Old Testament. And then there were a couple hundred years where no more Scripture was written. But Malachi was a prophet. And much of his writing is indicting God's people for not honoring him. Much of the writing is going after God's people and indicting them because they were not honoring God. And in Malachi 2, where we're going to start today, he levels two claims against the people. The first, which we're just going to summarize, the first is this, that they married women who didn't follow God. His writing is indicting God's people for not honoring him. And the first claim against the people The first thing he's raising in his prosecution against the people is that they married women who didn't follow God. One of the best ways to prevent divorce happens before you ever get married. And it's this. Be incredibly choosy and picky about who you'll marry without apology. Be incredibly picky and choosy about who you'll marry without apology. And I know that she looks so fine, or I know that you look at him and you're like, "Mm, I never want to take my eyes off of him. But listen to me, for those of you who are dating somebody right now, it doesn't matter how hot they are. 
It doesn't matter. If you are not aligned spiritually, you are headed for disaster. They may be the most gorgeous person in the world. It doesn't matter. If you're not aligned spiritually, you are on a path for disaster. And you say, but I can change him. That's so cute. That's so cute. You can't. Or I could change her. You can't. Don't put yourself in God's role. Changing people is God's work. All right? So don't put yourself on God's level and think, I am so persuasive, or I am such, I'm, I'm just going to be able to help him, or I'm going to be able to help her. The, the best way to prevent divorce is to be incredibly picky about who you'll date. It's to be incredibly picky about who you'll choose to marry. And a non-starter has to be if you are not aligned spiritually. Get out of the relationship. And I know that you love him. I know that you love her. I know it's going to be painful. I know it's going to hurt. But if you are not married, you do not need to marry somebody who looks at things spiritually different than you. If you cannot be aligned in this, which is the most important relationship of your life, no other aspect of your relationship is going to work ultimately. And you are setting yourself up for disaster. Be incredibly picky. And then Malachi continues with the second claim in Malachi 2.13, where he says this. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? And so he's saying to the people, it seems like God is really far. You feel like God is really distant from you. It seems like God doesn't have his favor upon your life anymore. Why is that? And he answers the question, He asks a rhetorical question. He says, why do you feel like God is distant? Why do you feel like God isn't pouring out his favor on your life anymore? Why do you feel like God's not blessing you? He says this, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. He says, God seems far, and God seems distant, and God isn't pouring his blessing out on your life anymore because you're out sleeping around, and you have a wife to whom you have made a vow, to whom you have taken on as yours. You have become united as one, and you are out sleeping around and cheating on her. That's why God feels distant. That's why God feels far. Adultery will destroy you. It will come in and it will destroy you. It will eat you from the inside out. And that is the problem, that it always looks so good to start. It always looks so appealing when things get stale at home and there's the chase again and there's the sense of adventure and she looks good and she says things to you that your wife no longer says to you or he looks good and he values you in ways your husband doesn't value you anymore and it makes you feel good and it makes you feel excited and it makes you feel fulfilled for a moment but it will destroy you from the inside out out and it creates a distance not just between you and your spouse but it's a, it creates a distance between you and your creator he, Malachi continues did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union and what was the one god seeking godly offspring So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Guard yourselves. Guard yourselves. Put parameters in place. Guard yourself. You need to have somebody that you can be completely honest with. 
You need to have somebody that you can be completely honest with so that when temptation comes, and it will, because God has designed us to be people who enjoy sex. That's how he's wired us. So temptation will come your way. And when it does, you need to have people in your life that you can be completely honest with, that have your best interest in mind, that will shoot straight with you, that will be honest with you, that won't talk about it with anybody else, that will take it to their grave and somebody you can confide in so that when you feel tempted and when you feel weak and when the appeal looks like it's better than the consequences and you start diminishing the consequences and you start elevating the appeal, they can come alongside you and they can speak caution into your life. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to listen to them, but you should. But you need to have somebody in your life to help you in that process. You need to put things in your life that will stop you before you even get close. Because ultimately, it is nobody else's responsibility other than your own. And oftentimes what can happen is people will use that accountability dynamic, which can be really important, but use that as an excuse and as a crutch and say, well, if somebody would have done a better job of holding me accountable, then I wouldn't have accessed all that material online. Or if somebody would have done a better job holding me accountable, then we would have never gotten to the point where we were exchanging those texts. And you pass the buck. No, ultimately you are responsible and nobody else, but you have to have people in your life who you can be open and honest with, that will pray for you, that will help you and hold you accountable, but understanding that ultimately it is you who are responsible for your conduct and nobody else, but guard yourself. And so for some people, that means you might have to get rid of a smartphone because you can't handle it. For some people, that means you need to change your phone number. And there's some contacts you don't need to share that new number with. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. We have some charts on our fridge to try to teach our boys that there's value in work. And once they fill up the chart, they get a set amount of money to go and to go to the toy store and pick out whatever they want as long as it's under that threshold. And if it's over that, then they have to pay for the difference out of their piggy bank. We're trying to teach them responsible spending. We're trying to teach them that there's value with hard work. And, and they're, they're stickers on the chart. Well, when somebody who's young sticks their sticker on the wrong chart, (laughs) they get a little frustrated. And they try to rip the sticker off. But if you've ever tried to rip a sticker off a piece of paper or off a chore chart, and I don't really know why you would, but if you ever have, then you would understand that once something is stuck on, there's no clean separation. And you might be able to get that sticker off the chore chart, but if you do, it's still, it's not going to be as sticky as it was, and there's going to be some residue, and there's going to be some evidence left behind on the chore chart where you ripped the sticker off. So when Malachi here talks about covering your garment with violence when you get divorced, what he's talking about is this process that our society has told us can be so clean and it can be so kind and you can remain good friends even though you get divorced. There will be, there will be residue. There will be scars that are left behind. And yes, some divorces leave deeper scars than others, but make no mistake. Every time it happens, there is pain. There are consequences. There is no such thing as this pleasant process that people go through and and leave unchanged. And people may convince themselves in their mind that, that that's occurred. But spiritually, God tells us no. 
We go to Matthew now, in the words of Jesus, in Matthew 5, 31. And he's talking to an audience, and he says this. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. So there's this thought process that as long as they settle things legally, it was permissible. So long as everybody divorced legally, that, that things would be permissible and everything would be fine, that the, the husband would give his ex-wife a certificate of divorce showing that they were, they were no longer married. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Jesus says, you've heard it said that if you just handle things legally, if you just give somebody a certificate of divorce, you've handled it, it's fine, it's taken care of. But I say, but I raise the standard, and here's what I say. I say everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, meaning when there's adultery, divorce is permissible. It doesn't mean that it has to occur but it is permissible along those lines, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. See, marriage is permanent in God's sight. It's permanent. And adultery allows for a permissible, a permissible escape, but it doesn't mean that it's a necessity. It's permissible in God's sight, but it doesn't mean it's a necessity. And this is why it's so important that we understand our conduct and we understand how much God values marriage and how holy we have to keep relationships between husbands and wives. And I know for some of you, you've been married for a really long time, and it seems like there are better options on the horizon. Things have gotten stale. And I'm just telling you, never forsake love in an attempt to find romance. It will always leave you empty. Never forsake love in an attempt to find romance. It will always leave you empty. And to those of you who are married, I want to give this, this warning and this encouragement to you. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't think your work's done. Like, ah, I'm married. Doesn't matter. Keep pursuing your spouse. Keep the fire alive. Make sure that you spend time to talk to them. Make sure that you spend time to value them. Spend time going out. Spend time making sure that you look your best. Be there for them as their emotional support. Keep the romance alive. Keep pursuing your spouse. Don't quit. Don't think, we're married. We've made a commitment. We're fine. I don't have to put in any more effort. Give your spouse your best. Keep pursuing them. So we've seen the toll of adultery, and we've seen how God really values marriage. And he said it's permissible when there's adultery to, to get out of the marriage then. And we go now to 1 Corinthians 7, where the Apostle Paul adds this. He says, to the rest I say, I not the Lord. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Now, he's not at odds with Jesus here. When he says to the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. He's not at odds with Jesus, but what he's doing is he's introducing a new dynamic. Obviously, all the words that, that Jesus spoke are not recorded for us. And so the Apostle Paul here is making it very clear that what he's about to say is not at odds with what Jesus said about divorce, but he's introducing a new dynamic here to the church in Corinth. And what he says, and he prefaces it with this, is don't use your faith as a reason to leave the marriage. 
If you are a follower of Jesus and you find yourself married to somebody who doesn't follow Jesus, don't use your faith as the reason to leave the marriage. This is why backing up, it's so important when you're dating that you make sure that you are incredibly picky. And one of the things that you refuse to compromise on is spiritual matters. And you make sure that you are aligned spiritually because that is the most important aspect of who you are individually. And you cannot be united if you are not united on that front. But he says, if you find yourself in a relationship, one of you is a follower of Jesus, don't use your faith as a reason to leave that relationship. Then he continues, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And you're like, what in the world is he talking about? What he's saying is, your spou- the spouse who has faith, the spouse who has faith, can draw their spouse to Jesus by their example and raise their kids, pointing them to Jesus by their example that is gone from the equation if a divorce occurs. Conversion is not the responsibility of the spouse who follows Jesus. That is not their responsibility. Conversion is the work of God. Conversation is their responsibility. That they can have a conversation. That they can point in their conduct to Jesus. So don't just assume because I'm a Christian and I'm married to somebody who isn't a follower of Jesus that I need to get out of the relationship. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. And this is one of the most heartbreaking aspects of marriages and of relationships that we have to confront. And that is simply this. We can't control anyone else. We can't control the conduct. We can't control the thought process. We can't control other people. We can't control what they do. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. And I want to talk to you about the ramifications of this. That some of you might find controversial. But I believe when he talks about if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. He is not just talking about the physical act of leaving, but that this extends to conduct as well. So listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. If you ever find yourself in a physically abusive relationship, You need to separate immediately. I am not saying you have to get divorced, but you must take yourself and your kids out of that equation immediately and get safe first and foremost. And understand you are not operating outside of God's will should you do so. calls us to peace. Called to peace. There is an element of conduct within this that we need to recognize. And that does not mean that divorce has to occur. And with counseling and with work, we have seen some beautiful pictures of God restoring relationships where horrendous things have taken place. But what it does mean, and please listen to me, is if you ever find yourself, and gentlemen, you're not excluded from this, if you ever find yourself in a relationship where you are the recipient of abuse and you fear for your safety, you need to vacate that area immediately and understand you are still operating within God's will. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? 
Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? The reality is this. We aren't responsible for anyone else's salvation. Be smart in who you date. Be so incredibly picky. To those of you who aren't married, listen to me. Be incredibly, incredibly picky. It is always, always, always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. Always. Do not lower your standards. Do not settle. Have standards and adhere to them. And make sure whomever you allow in your life and give your heart to has those same standards. Don't settle. To those of you who are married, take divorce off the table. As a couple. Just say, we, we, are going to face, we are going to face good times. We are going to face bad times. We are going to have just incredible moments, and there are going to be moments we can't stand one another. But we are going to make the commitment that we will fight for our relationship. And we will make the commitment that we will take divorce off the table as an option. Because in our culture, all too often what happens is as soon as trouble comes, we head for the exit. And we're convinced, if I just end this relationship, that the the trouble will, will be gone as well. And nothing could be further from the truth. Understand if you find yourself tempted to stray outside of the confines of marriage. The price is always higher than the thrill. Safeguard yourself. Guard your conduct. Put in place standards and make sure that you will not Cheat on those standards. If you find yourself in a relationship that has been shattered by adultery, understand that it is permissible for you to seek an end. That you don't have to. And that God can work even in the midst of that. If you find yourself in a relationship with somebody on the other end of the spiritual spectrum than you and they're willing to stay and they're willing to to be in it, then you stay in that relationship and you pray for them like crazy. And in your conduct, do all that you can to point them and your kids, if you have them, to Jesus. If you find yourself in a relationship where you do not feel safe, you need to separate It does not mean you have to pursue divorce, but it does mean you have to get yourself to a place of safety. Because God has called us to be people of peace. And understand this. There's grace. Maybe you find yourself victim. Maybe you're the perpetrator. Maybe you've blown it. Maybe you've made mistakes. Maybe right now you're in the midst of this. And your heart is breaking and and you're like, oh, understand this. God's grace is sufficient for you in this season of your life as well. 
And the reason that God is so strong about this message is because what this has the power to do to us individually. It will leave a stain. It will leave a scar on your life. But God is greater than any stain that we've put on our lives. God is able to heal our scars. And there is grace available for you. Not as a crutch, not as an excuse, not as a way to say, well, great, I can do whatever I want. No, that's not how following Jesus works. But I want you to know if you find yourself close to here, or if you find yourself in the midst of here today, that you do not need to walk through this alone. We're a community. We love and we care and we value people and we want to walk alongside you. Because this is going to hurt. And we want to be there for you to support you. And just one final word I just want to say to those of you who are step parents, you have the hardest job in the world. And you have our admiration and our respect and anything we can do to help you in this journey, we are happy and here to do for you. Because divorce not only impacts the people going through the process, it impacts the kids as well. For you to come into this dynamic, it is incredibly challenging, it's incredibly difficult, and we so admire what you do, and we want you to know that we celebrate you, and we are here for you to help you however we can. Because that's what a community should do. And we caution you, don't let yourself get to this point if you're not here. But if you're here, We point you to the grace of God and we say, let us walk with you and help you. God, I pray that the marriages in this place would be strong. I pray, God, right now for people who are dating. And I pray that they'd be incredibly picky, unapologetically. That you would give them the boldness and the strength that they need to have a tough conversation. I pray, God, for marriages. Just that we wouldn't quit. We wouldn't give up. We'd continue to pursue one another. We'd love each other deeply. Pray, God, for for people who've gone through or who are going through this process right now of having a marriage end. And I pray you wouldn't make them feel like they have to go through it alone. Well, they would seek support. And we could walk alongside them and comfort them and help them. Got to pray for for step-parents. That you just give them the patience that they need. That you would help them as, as their stepkids will lash out in anger and say things that they don't really mean, but because they're hurting and because they're emotional, they just say. Allow them to be a picture of your grace. Allow them to feel appreciated as well. And God, we ask you to work. In the lives of the single person. We ask you to work in the marriages. We ask you to work in the hearts of those who are going through divorces right now. God, we just want to do our best to follow you. So help us in that, we ask. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.